I've worked for some incredible human beings in my life. Um, and Bill Parks leaves them all in the dust. I mean, you're talking about a man who literally has, has given his fortune away. I mean, every penny of the fortune that he's earned, he's given away. Um, but nothing really more significantly than when he gave NRS to the employees. Um, and that's the, the story of, of that bill, you know, 100 years from now, some economics professor will write a story about Bill Parks. That was Jim McAllister telling us a story about the man who is the essence of NRS. Bringing it full circle today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. If you're new to the podcast, uh, stop right now, click the subscribe button in your app of choice. This will assure that you get updated when that next episode arrives to your phone. Jim McAllister, head of sales at NRS, is here to break down the ultimate gear list for your next river trip. Jim shares the story behind the NRS strap, the fishing frame, and the Bill's bag, plus many other game-changing products that uh, NRS has been producing for a number of years now. Jim also shares the personal story behind the inflatable drift boat and what happened that took it out of the lineup. This one definitely resonated with me on along the way, so I hope it uh, does with you as well. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsors. Sawyer offers a full line of modern and traditional products for oarsmen, canoeists, kayakers, and paddlers from all genres, providing unsurpassed function, performance, and beauty. The Sawyer Artisan Oar is their very popular square top oar with carbon fiber X weave fiberglass shaft reinforcement featuring prints of fish species from artists around the country passionate about fisheries and fishing art. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Sawyer to grab your set today. OPST's rods represent decades of dedication to sustained anchor two-handed casting. These rods are a true illustration of Skagit Master Edward's vision. The Micro Series comes exceptionally close to single-handed specs and is proving to be a unique tool for trout and smallmouth anglers alike. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash OPST to get started right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash OPST. Without further ado, here is Jim McAllister from NRS.com. How's it going, Jim? Good. I'm doing great this morning, Dave. It's uh, still trying to, to decide if it wants to be spring or winter up here in northwest Montana, but uh, it's decided on spring today. Sun is shining, so uh, we're doing good. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah, northwest Montana. We'll hopefully dig into a little bit of that. I always think uh, when I think Idaho or when I think NRS, I think Idaho, but it sounds like, uh, yeah, you guys probably like most companies are spread around the country. Yes, correct. We're we're spread all over the place. Um, I am fortunate enough to have married a third generation Montana native. Um, so, after college, I moved up to Whitefish with her, and um, I've worked from I've worked for NRS for going on fifteen years. But I've always been fortunate enough to do it from from a home office up in up in Whitefish, Montana. Oh, perfect! Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's. Uh... It's kind of a uh, not only obviously Montana's got a lot of stuff, but it's kind of a skiing uh, mecca, right? It is, yeah. We, I, I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to call it <clears throat> a mecca. Not a mecca. <laughs> uh, well, it, I, I, I personally, it certainly is my mecca. Um, but it's one of those things that uh, we don't have the acreage of a Vale or a Jackson uh, or a Whistler type resort. But what we do, what the thing that Big Mountain is famous for, which is the name of our ski resort, is fog. Um, Hmm. we get, we get a lot of fog and, um, a lot of inclement weather, which has kind of saved us from becoming a veil or a whistler or a Jackson. Um, so it's a little bit smaller of a resort, um, but it's home kind of a, kind of a thing. Gotcha. (laughs) That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So it's great. We've, we've had a great ski season and obviously I'm one of those people who gets to double dip. Yep. Um, in terms of, you know, I get to, to play in it and ski on it, um, all winter. And then as it starts to run off and, uh, turn into measurable CFS, uh, I get to, you know, drool over it as I look at the GS, uh, USGS sites all summer and spring and, um, and then get to put my boat in the water and, and, and play on it again. So, um, very fortunate. That's pretty cool. Yeah. There's a, 
there's been a lot of overlap in the snowboarding, skiing. You know, obviously a lot of people that are into fly fishing also love lots of outdoor activities. And we've had some good uh, good s- uh, stories about skiing. But uh, we probably won't dig into much of that today. I wanted to touch on, um, you know, obviously NRS uh, is... I feel like, you know, you've been one of the leaders out there for quite a while and trying new things, especially when you think of fly fishing and kind of the fishing gear. But uh, before we get there, talk about how you first got into fly fishing, because you do a little bit of that too, right? I do, yeah. Um, So I grew up in Fort Collins, Colorado, and uh, go Rams. My mom is a Ram. Um, (laughs) So I grew up in Colorado, which obviously, as I'm sure you and many of your listeners know, is is a mecca for fly fishing. and was one of those people who was fortunate enough to be uh, brought to fly fishing by my grandfather. Uh, my mom's dad taught me how to fly fish when I was a, a really, really young person, um, maybe five or six years old. Uh, was are my first memories of of being on the Arkansas or tromping around, you know, whatever stream we were on for the weekend. Um, and from there, it, you know, I carried it with me for a long time. I kind of took a little bit of a break. I went to college um, in, down in Tucson uh, at the University of Arizona. So not, not, a, not a tremendous number of fly fishing mm-hmm. opportunities out your front door there. Um, but by my junior year, I had, um, started chomping at the bit so desperately that, uh, I put out some applications and started working in Alaska. Um, and that, I guess, as they say, the rest of the story is history. Um, I was hired by a lodge, um, in Southwest Alaska out on Bristol Bay called Crystal Creek. Um, worked as a dock boy for those guys kind of to get my start. Um, and then eventually became a fly fishing guide. I worked in Alaska, As a fly fishing guide for a number of years, I worked in Montana and Idaho um, as a fly fishing guide for a number of years. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm definitely a fly fisherman, Mm -hmm. Um, spent all my days off on the river. I'm actually set to launch with a crew of NRSers um, on the Smith on Friday. So um, looking forward to swinging some flies there. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, so I've I've been a, a lifelong angler. Um, it, it's for me, definitely the, the very top of the list. Like you say, it's, uh, snowboarding and, the, and then fly fishing. So uh. is that the order? So is, <laughs> it, that's the order, right? Snowboarding, not, not fly fishing, it's then snowboarding. So it's crazy. It, it, I, it definitely is snowboarding. And I'm one of those people who my career, like all of us, as we get older has, has become more and more important and has taken up more and more of my time. Um, and I think I have to put snowboarding first only because for me, snowboarding is really the definition of my kind of Zen moment. Um, people call it the white room. People say whatever they want to say about skiing. But for me, truthfully, when I'm in deep powder snowboarding, I am not thinking about anything else. Um, the, the next turn is the only thing in my mind and I am, I'm guilty of, um, you know, standing in a steelhead run and shoot, my mind thinks of everything. Yeah. I I'm all over the place. I can, you know, fix all the problems that, uh, you know, global hunger, world peace. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've worked through all of them many times over. Um, so my mind still keeps going a lot when I'm, when I'm fly fishing, uh, whereas snowboarding is, is, is fully Zen. So that's the only reason, I guess, if I had to pick one that I can only do yep. one, one day type thing, I guess it would have to be snowboarding, but um, but fly fishing is a passion. And as you know, it was a job, um, in Alaska, it's, you know, 125 days straight, um, is what I would do. Crystal Creek, you know, is, is one of the best fly fishing, fly fishing experiences on the earth. As far as I'm concerned, um, you know, you wake up every morning, you get in a beaver, uh, fly to one of the most remote streams known to man in Southwest Alaska, um, and proceed to, you know, put people into 30 inch rainbows all day. It, mm. it literally is the best job that anybody's ever dreamt of having ever. Um, of course, until I discovered NRS. So yeah, that's right. It, it's, it, I've been very, very, very fortunate in, in that respect to, um, always, always find something that can pay my bills that I'm also passionate about it. I've been very lucky in that respect. That's cool. Yeah. Maybe we'll touch on if we have time at the end, a little more on the crystal Creek in Alaska, cause I'm interested. I'm trying to set up some trips, uh, with, you know, listeners on the, of the podcast here, uh, in the next year or so. So, um, yeah, maybe we can touch base, but I, I want to dig into NRS because obviously that's the, the topic at hand here and really focusing on um, more of the gear you guys provide and we could maybe talk it just generally but um, 
Talk about NRS. You know, obviously, you know, there's lots of the rafts, you know, the life jackets, there's a ton of stuff. But as far as the fishing gear, um, what would you say if somebody says, like, you know, explain your lineup? What do you guys have out there for fishing gear? So, again, I'm incredibly biased. And for me, somebody says to me, what's your best, you know, fishing item? I would have to say it's an otter raft. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, just for me, because that would effectively be the foundation of, of where it all got started. Um, obviously as anglers, we're always all looking for that next spot where, where are you going to go this weekend? Where, where are we going to go find them this weekend? You know, what's that big trip for the fall that's coming up. And, and for me, it really all starts with access. And that is the thing that NRS provides to anglers is access. Um, I am notorious for, you know, bringing some NRS guys out to Montana and we'll be driving down the, some dirt road and effectively the middle of nowhere and, um, slam on the brakes. And the guys are like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, we're here. (laughs) What what do you mean we're here? It's like, oh yeah, this is the bridge. We're just going to throw the raft right off this sucker. There is no actual put in. Um, and, and for us, you know, that, that's, uh, that's always kind of been the way, way we've done it out here in Montana. Um, Alaska, even more so, right? Like find a place that no one's been to and let's go explore it. Either the fishing's going to be absolutely awful or it's going to be the best day that any of us have ever imagined. So I always have to start with the raft. Yeah. Uh, when, when, when I say what, what's the best piece of equipment that NRS makes, it's, it's the rubber. It, it's that otter boat that allows you to kind of get anywhere that you've ever dreamt of going. Um, and then, you know, of course, secondary to that or, or, you know, right up there with that would, of course, be the frame. Um, when I came to NRS, I'd obviously sat in an NRS fishing frame for hundreds and hundreds of days as a guide um, and had spent quite a bit of time thinking about the ways that, you know, it could kind of improve. Um, I'd been at NRS for literally less than 100 days um, before we had developed the thigh hooks, the casting platforms. Um, We reworked a ton of that frame part, uh, a a ton Mm -hmm. of those frame parts within, you know, like I said, the first three months of my arrival at NRS. So um, I guess I would have to say the frame is the second part of it that that really has allowed NRS to um, become a household name in terms of the the fishing industry. Um, You know, countless folks have made a trip out west, had a guide day, and whether they know it or not, they were, you know, standing in or or being rowed down a river on an NRS frame. So um, those are the meat and and bones or, or, you know, meat and potatoes rather uh, of the line in terms of where it all got started. Um, and then, you know, of course the, the, the next item that comes up without even giving it any thought is the Chinook PFD. Yeah. Um, you know, that was really grassroots in terms of we were building the Chinook before anybody was even, you know, anybody to speak of, uh, was even really doing any kayak fishing, right? We, Mm -hmm. we had the Chinook on the market, um, before kayak fishing was, was really a thing nationally. And, and we've been very, very fortunate, uh, you know, to, <clears throat> we had a number of partners who came to us early on people like Robert field, who, when they got into the sport of kayak fishing, um, came to us with some immediate tweaks to that product. Hey guys, if you changed X, Y, and Z on that Chinook, um, it would be ideal for what I do in a kayak type thing. And of course we were more than happy to, um, to make those changes as they were clear improvements. And so I would say the, the Chinook is, is up there as well in terms of everybody, um, who knows NRS fishing should definitely be familiar with the Chinook. Not only is it super comfortable to wear, um, but for me, it's, it's become my go-to in terms of comfort, in terms of, you know, the ability to bring some stuff with you down the river. Um, you know, I'll be honest with you, Dave, when I first came to NRS, I was one of those fly fishermen who never, ever, ever wore a PFD yeah. ever when I was in the boat, Oh yeah. uh, come to NRS and, and that's not an option, right? You want to go on the company trips, you put a PFD on at the boat launch and it stays on and, and, until you're at camp type deal. Um, so that was a learning process for me. And all of a sudden it, it, I realized, oh my gosh, uh, we actually make really, really comfortable life jackets, something that I've never <laughs> worn before. Exactly. So, um, so I would, you know, certainly go there. And then, you know, after the, the Chinook, there's a number of other products that we make that I personally use obviously every day of my life. But certainly when I go fishing, the NRS strap, of course, has yep. to be up there. 
the pilot knife is one that I keep on my PFD at all times, whether it's to, you know, make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich <laughs> or to, to cut a snagged anchor line. Um, you know, that's one of those skews that I certainly always keep handy. Um, and then, you know, honestly, the, the other go-tos for me have, have really evolved over the last five to seven years and, and all that stuff would, the rest of it would come from our apparel line. Yeah. Uh, you know, our sun shirts, I, I'm one of those fly fishing guides who, you know, 25 years ago when I started doing it, um, you know, I'd show up not in Alaska, but in Montana, I'd show up in, you know, uh, a nice pair of board shorts and flip flops and a, a short sleeved collared shirt to, to do a full day, you know, guide tour and not even think twice about all the sun that I, that I was, you know, exposing my body to. Well, fast forward to 2020, 2021. And I mean, shoot, I'm one of those people who looks like they're getting ready to rob a bank, uh, prior to going fishing, right. I've got the buff full the way, all the way up over my face. I've got the big giant, you know, sombrero sun <laughs> hat. I've, I've got the H2 core long sleeve hoodie on, I mean, full long pants, like, uh, yeah. you know, the sun can't get, get an inch of my skin anymore. So that, that would <laughs> definitely be for me, some of the other absolute must have, you know, NRS fishing product would be all of our sun, sun apparel. Perfect. Perfect. Um, yeah. And obviously, I mean, and, and even as you were talking there, it's so funny, it just shows you how much NRS is ingrained into, um, to everything. If you're like in the boating at all, because the NRS strap, I wasn't even thinking about, but it's just, it's like daily use, you know, it's not even, it's not even <laughs> use on, you know, I mean, I use that thing. It's like, it's almost like duct tape. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you, you make sure to have a few NRS straps in because you never know what you'll need it for. Right. So true. Yeah, It so. is so true. And I agree with you a hundred percent. So obviously you know, working at a very remote, uh, fly fishing lodge in, in Alaska, two things that you would never, ever, ever imagine getting on an airplane without the first is duct tape. The yep. second is an NRS strap <laughs> because you can fix almost anything. I've seen people, you know, reattach an entire jet motor with a NRS strap and some duct tape. I mean, the things that you, the situations you can get yourself out of, uh, with a roll of duct tape and a couple of NRS strap. I mean, I, mean, I don't know if there's anything that you can't get yourself out of. So, yeah, um, exactly. I'm with you a hundred percent. That's cool. That's cool. Well, I mean, we can, and we could dig into all these things that, you know, we probably won't have time to do it all, but I, maybe let's just start at the top, the NRS frame, you know, I mean, that's the one thing. I mean, obviously there's a lot of bells and whistles. It's customizable, you know, and that's a whole nother part of the service you guys provide but you know describe so somebody new somebody that hasn't been in a frame before can you describe that thing and, and maybe compare it to what else is in, on the market for rafting frames yeah absolutely so the nrs frame is for you know somebody who's never been in a boat or isn't familiar with this setup an nrs frame is effectively the contraption that goes on top of the rubber that allows you to first and foremost drive the boat. So steer it, right? Yeah. This is the frame that, you know, is going to allow you to basically mount your rowing setup onto the boat. So the first job of a frame is to allow you to, you know, drive the boat, um, down the river in the line that you want. Obviously, like you said, we could get really get into the weeds here with crab strokes and appropriate yeah. distant from the bank and, you know, all those types of things. But, um, you know, so that's the first, the first, you know, real job of a frame is to get you down the river safely in terms of allow you to row it. Um, and then secondary for the frame is it really allows you to kind of what I say to people is, um, a raft without a frame is a blank canvas. And mm -hmm. so in a retail setting, what I, what I often say to people is, Hey, describe for me your most ideal Saturday on the river. And yeah. from the information that you provide me, I'll build you a frame. Hmm. So if I'm talking to somebody like yourself, Dave, and yeah. you know, Hey, describe for me your most ideal weekend. And you, you give me, Hey, I'm going to go fishing with the boys. Um, I want to really strip down lightweight frame. What I'm basically going to do for you is build you my standard, you know, stock NRS fishing frame. That's going to provide you a couple of places, uh, for each of your anglers to sit a spot for the rower to sit, and then maybe a couple of bays for a cooler or, mm -hmm. you know, some gear storage, 
Um, but, but really quite simple. And you know, that, that also can be applied to the person who says, Hey, um, you know, my ideal weekend is, uh, is launching, you know, on a multi-day trip on, you know, the, the wilderness section of the South Fork and the Flathead or something like that. Um, that's a completely different frame, right? That person's going to have multiple bays for coolers, for dry boxes. They're going to need everything to be super compact and, you know, very nicely balanced throughout the boat because they're going to be running big white water on a daily basis. Um, so the frame is really for me, um, kind of what dictates the function of your boat, Yep. The, the frame allows you to take a 14 foot otter and make it a super decked out fishing package, but it also allows you to take that same 14 foot otter and create, you know, the super, the super dialed, uh, multi-day, you know, 15 day, 20 day right. middle fork, uh, package type thing. So the frame really is the, the boat is the, again, the foundation, but the frame really determines what you're going to get done or, or how you're going to mm-hmm. spend your time in the boat. Um, yeah. yeah. Does that do a good enough job? of? Kind oh, yeah. Of descri- yeah. No. Yeah, and I, okay. I mean, I think that's a struggle today is just going to be is that everything you say, I've got, you know, like 50 questions that we could, you know what I mean? I, because I think about sure. my experience, I, I actually had an NRS frame uh, a while back and, um, you know, it was really cool, the experience, because I went to you guys and I said, you know, I need this just like you're saying. And I and I and the cool thing is, is you guys were really service oriented as far as customizing it, because not only is the frame itself, it comes in the box, you can customize it, but you guys actually uh, cut some stuff for me and, and made it right so it was fit perfectly and I mean I had this thing down in I had both of the dry boxes which are amazing I had you know the cooler I, I had pretty much every bell and whistle you could have on the funny thing about it is is that when my first daughter was born I had the choice between uh, you know I was to pay for the whole thing I was like okay I got a drift boat and I got this amazing NRS thing and I ended up and I if you can believe it I sold the raft and, yeah. uh, and it was one of those bummer things that obviously it's, uh, so I'm hopeful I'll get one again because I think it's such a, uh, a such an amazing tool. Like you said, you're on the, you're on the bridge. You can't throw a drift boat off the side of a bridge, but a raft you can, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. And it's, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, the, the experience of how people come to a raft is, is always so interesting for me. I, I have so many, you know, experiences of traveling around the country and, you know, of course you just making small talk with folks. Oh, what do you do? Or, you know, where do you come from type thing and start talking about an NRS raft and, and the number of people who have an experience with their family, um, with a group of friends that they associate with my product Hmm. is so cool. Um, I can't tell you the number of people who are like, Ooh, I know your brand. I, I did a middle fork trip. That's right. And at the time, like they didn't even know that NRS was a thing or, or who we are or what we stand for or any of that type stuff. But they remember the three letters off of the bow of the raft that they sat in for seven days, you know, with their mom and dad going down the middle fork type thing. And, um, we're so fortunate to obviously have a product that in its nature, it's, it's designed to make people happy. You know, there was, there was never a day that you were like, oh, damn it. I have to go put my fishing boat in the river and, uh, you know, go spend, go spend a day in the flathead. I mean, we're all so fortunate that really, you know, my job is to sell people exactly. fun. Make it, make it easy <laughs> for people to get out. And, and I want to touch, you know, there's a few things on more of the gear we can dig into. I, I, I want to kind of uh, break here just for a minute because you mentioned NRS. And again, let's take it back. So NRS, first of all, what is that? Because that stands for something, right? It does. Yeah. It stands for Northwest River Supply. Okay. Nor- Northwest River Supply. And, and and talk about, just a little bit, because I know there's a, a history there, obviously a founder history. Can you talk about the person? Just bring us back. You don't have to tell the whole thing, but take us back to, you know, kind of the start. Who, who started this company and how did it grow into the, the leader that it is today? So, I mean, this is uh, one of the best stories in the outdoor industry. Uh, So Bill Parks is the founder of NRS. Um, Bill was a, is a PhD, was a professor of economics at the University of Oregon in Eugene um, back in the day and um, basically left Eugene to move to the University of Idaho in Moscow. And while teaching at the University of Idaho, um, basically had the idea of he wanted to put what he was teaching into motion. 
He wanted to actually prove that somebody could start a company and run it with all of these morals and all of these values and still be successful, have a company that's not just based on making money. Um, so Bill Park started NRS in his garage almost 50 years ago as a catalog company, direct to consumer. Um, and so Bill's background is that he was a outfitter on the middle fork of the salmon. And as he was, uh, you know, teaching classes at the university, um, you know, throughout the rest of the year and then guiding run, run rafts down the middle fork in the summer, they started running into issues like, like you well, um, outfitting people in the wilderness. And the first thing that they came up with, uh, originally they were tying gear into rafts, tying frames down to rafts with bailing twine. Um, obviously bailing twine was a nightmare for entrapment issues, uh, for, you know, uh, freeing the boat. If you wrapped it around a rock issues, just, you know, a number of yeah. reasons why, uh, bailing twine was a nightmare. So enter Bill Parks. Uh, he comes up with this idea of the NRS strap, um, you know, figures out a way to mass produce these things and boom, now, now you have NRS with its very first product. So let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. OPST's Micro Series has been designed to pleasantly accommodate both single hand and two handed waterborne casts. Sporting single weld upper grips, switch style lower handles, a medium fast action, and a short length that makes almost anything possible. Uh, I've been swinging flies for trout with this, uh, this lovely rod uh, with the Micro Series lately, and it's been really amazing. In fact, um, on my last dry fly trip, I actually put the uh, Skagit line away, grabbed an old reel with a five weight line. Uh, I think it was a weight forward line, tossed that on this rod and it casted. Uh, how did it cast? It was like a dream. Um, lots of power and a super delicate touch. It kind of feels like this rod pretty much does it all. So, um, so this is pretty amazing stuff. Whether you are swinging soft tackles, throwing heavy articulated streamers, or busting bushy salmon flies into the teeth of an afternoon breeze, these nifty little hybrid rods should have a permanent place in your quiver. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash OPST to get it started right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash OPST. Okay, let's get back to the show. Is that strap, um, you know, that whatever you call it, you don't call it a camshaft, but it's the unique, like when he made that, was there anything like You know, I'm going to, I would be ignorant if I said, no, there's nothing out there ever. But I, I want to say a hundred percent, there was absolutely nothing out there. Um, there may have been some, you know, like the, the traditional, like, um, r like real ratchet that you're kind of cranking down that yeah, strap. Yeah, the ratchet, which, which, which. Which aren't any good for, I mean, yeah, the ratchet's got all sorts of problems. I mean, that's the, the amazing thing about the NRS strap, and I'm sure I'm guessing that probably hasn't changed since day one, right, since he started because it's such a perfect, like, it's so easy to use, right, and it straps so tightly that you never worry about it. I mean, you could, uh, you could strap anything to it. So has it changed over the years? Have you evolved it that? It has thing? had one slight tweak, and the only slight tweak to it is that we updated the buckle. Um, we just basically went to a dropped for a drop forged buckle, which is just a little bit different manufacturing process, but no, in terms of design, the webbing, none of that stuff has changed in, in 50 years. It's kind of one of those situations of if it's not broken, don't fix it. And, and, and that one's definitely not broken. So <laughs> that's right. That's right. So uh, let's keep, uh, let's, I want to hear a little more of the bill story. So keep it going. And you mentioned that, and you mentioned before, uh, before we get there, you, we were talking about a, a list. I actually thought I was like, okay, what are 20 things you need? You mentioned almost uh, nine things, but a 10 is the bill's bag, right? You didn't yep. mention and the bill's bag. And that was the other skew that they invented immediately um, was the bill's bag. Uh, prior to that, I don't know, you know, when your time on the water started, but I was a kid who, um, was sent up to a, a wilderness camp as, as a young man, like a canoe tripping camp when I was, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, that age. And back in those days on a canoe trip, what we were given for a dry bag was the old military yeah. delousing bag. Yeah. Right. The Which non, is like non waterproof, a... heavy canvas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. God. Uh, it's like this big green rubber trash bag that, you know, you stuffed your down sleeping bag into and all the rest of your ge precious gear for a week. And if it thought about raining, your stuff got wet. Right. Or yep. if, 
like a, a half of a, a wave came over the gunnel of your canoe. All of your stuff got wet. It was the worst version of a dry bag ever. Um, <laughs> and that's what those guys were stuck using, you know, on the middle fork and on the grand Canyon and all those places as well. So yeah, hundred yeah. percent when Bill invented, um, something that was an actual roll top dry bag and people started being able to go to sleep in a dry sleeping bag. I mean, talk about revolutionary, right? That's amazing. Um, yeah. but yeah, so, so the history of, of NRS is, is that it's, it's Bill Parks. It is, yeah. it is truthfully one man. There are, you know, 150 of us roughly huh. now that work for the company. Um, but Bill Parks is, is the founder and I can't stress this enough. Um, you know, people talk about character and, and, and morals and leadership yeah. and, and all those types of things. And, and I can say this as a person who's worked for amazing human beings. I mean, Dan Michaels, the, the owner of Crystal Creek Lodge, they don't make people better than that. I, I've worked for some incredible mm. human beings in my life. Um, and Bill Parks leaves them all in the dust. Mm. I mean, you're talking about a man who literally has, has given his fortune away. I mean, every penny of the fortune that he's earned, he's given away. Um, but nothing really more significantly than when he gave NRS that's to right. the employees. That's right. Um, and that's the, the story of, of that bill, you know, a hundred years from now, some economics professor will write a story about Bill Parks and, the company that he built in his garage and, you know, like many people these days, he was offered, you know, countless millions to sell out to private equity or yeah. venture capital. And, and, you know, shoot, I'll be honest, m many of us would have, right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can tell you if I owned a company and somebody rolled up and said, Hey, here's a couple hundred million bucks. Yeah. Uh, you and I would be having this phone call from my yacht I in know. the Mediterranean. Right. Yep. I mean, yep. <laughs> let's be honest. I know. Uh, not built. Not yeah. Bill. Bill said, you know, no, thank you. Um, this is his famous line that he said to me more than once. Um, you know, Jim, um, I eat three meals now and, and I have no need for four, huh. uh, which is just a crazy thing to, to, yeah. to listen to somebody say. But so basically what happened was um, you know, Bill, Bill got to the age 82, 83, somewhere in there when he decided that he was about done. And, um, at that point he came to the employees and, and basically offered us the company, Hey, if you guys get together and, and take a loan, I'll flip this whole thing over as an ESOP and, hmm. um, sell it, give it back to the employees, give it back to the people that, that helped me build it. So, um, Amazing. incredibly fortunate, man. It, it's, yeah. it's incredible how, one person's selfless action yeah. lifts up the hundred people around him and gave us all not only a sense of purpose, a, a, a tremendous sense of gratitude, um, but to, to say buy-in just doesn't do it justice. I mean, you know, we have people who work in our warehouse who have, who have been part of NRS for 20 years hmm. who are owners, who, who have a measurable stake um, in the company. They, they come to work every day, and it's not just about putting NRS straps into boxes to, to ship them around the country. But for them, they feel like every box that they pack, they're shipping to their customer. Um, you know, it's, it's a company that really takes pride in, in what we do. You'd mentioned, you know, the, the custom work on the, fr on the frame and things of that nature, all that stuff takes place right there at the, you know, the main campus in Moscow, Idaho. And, um, I mean, we have a full on engineer who works in our frame shop. This is a guy who could, you know, go down the road and, and get a job with Boeing or, or semi tool, or, I mean, he's an incredibly gifted guy. You can just basically describe, you know, some bend angles and lengths to th this guy. And he can build custom frames on, on bar napkins that, you know, have 500 bends and, um, you know, shocking boats, boats that we've built for the U S military. I mean, he's just an incredible person the, the company is full of, of really, really gifted people who have made the choice to stay with NRS and to invest their life working for NRS because we believe in what bill stands for, because we believe in, in working together as a team to achieve our end goals um, because we believe in, you know, again, Bill's, Bill's entire philosophy. And, and he's one of these people who would come through the sales floor in May, 
you know, when we're all just absolutely buried, phones off the hook, <laughs> more emails than you could ever possibly imagine getting back to. And and Bill would come by your desk and remind you that, you know, it wasn't 15 years ago that he was answering those phones. Um, and that those all of those people on, on the end of every single one of those phone calls are people that maybe Bill sold them their first strap or sold exactly. them their first drive bag, made them an NRS customer. And that's the legacy that we've all inherited. So huh. um, to say that there's a tremendous amount of responsibility that we all feel, or, or to me anyways, this this debt that I feel like I owe to Bill, where every every customer interaction that I have, um, you know, I, I, I can feel, feel Bill on my right yeah. shoulder there saying to me like, you know, what would I do? You better make sure you take good care of this guy type thing. How does that work when you're doing so like, well, obviously just describe quickly on the company. So the difference now you guys are owners versus say, if he was to sell it to some, you know, whatever, you know, to whoever, well, what is the difference? Yeah. You know, because there's a lot of companies I know out there that are working for some, is there a, and you're explaining, I mean, I feel it right. You this visceral, you know, it sounds like, but, but when you talk about the, maybe the, the monetary piece, how is that different? Well, it's, it's, so it's primarily different simply because, so had Bill just basically said, Hey, I'm going to sell out to private equity. Um, you know, who, whomever came and bought NRS would have written Bill that check for yeah. whatever it is, you know, 40, 50 million bucks. And, yeah. uh, Bill would have then been able to take that money and, and walk. Well, what ends up happening now is that as opposed to Bill taking his 40 million and retiring, um, Bill basically says to all of the employees who bought in, um, here's, here are your shares for the number of hours that you have worked. The, the legal division of shares inside of an ESOP would require five attorneys and a six hour podcast. So okay. <laughs> I, we can't really get <laughs> yeah, into not that. Going there. But, in, but in terms of the way that it's distributed, basically, as opposed to one person getting the full equity event and taking all of that off the table, that equity is dispersed amongst all of the employees. All so the employees. as opposed to one person making 40 million, a hundred people get 400,000. It doesn't obviously divide out that way. Yeah. Like I said, there's a ton of, of weeds stuff. that we can yeah, get. Yeah, 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 exactly. Gotcha. Um, yeah, but yeah. as opposed to one person walking away with all of it, he basically yeah. says, I don't want any of it. I want to give it to all of the That's people. That's right. Who work give for it to me. all the people and all those people. Now, and obviously the, the interesting thing about that is, is that, I mean, it's just, when you think about it from a business perspective and, and good and having great employees, I mean, you would think everybody would do that, right? Because I mean, it sounds like people love working there. You guys are passionate about it. It's just a great environment. Uh, I mean, I guess there's not much more you can say about it. I mean, he's just a, he's kind of a self, sounds like a selfless guy that just did the right thing. Yeah, it, that, that's exactly right. It, it's one of those things that almost like if you went and I'm fully generalizing here, but if you went to Manhattan and tried to explain to right. a bunch of Wall Street people what, what happened, happened, they wouldn't get it. No. Right. The your 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 bloodthirsty capitalist goes, no, he did it wrong. That's that's, that's right. not right. That's not right. That's, that's not right. what we're about. We're not Gosh. about, you know, uh, about Gosh. making this thing go back to all people. We're, we're about just capitalizing the dollar. And the other company that I always think of because it comes up so much, but and, and this is maybe different, but um, but is uh, Yvonne Chouinard, you know, with Patagonia, you know, the fact yeah. that he's doing it his own way and that he's, you know, the conservation piece. We always, I love hearing talking about that as well. But, but yeah, obviously we are, you know, there's a, you know, Bill is a whole, another episode. And, and is he still alive? He is. Yeah. Yep. He is still alive. And I actually was just on an email chain on Monday. Um, he still does. So Bill Parks, just another really quick side anecdote, um, is the one who basically created all of the CAD programs for all of our rafts. Bill is the initial, the original raft designer. So all of the the designs that you see in our shapes of our boats came from Bill's mind, and he is still doing that. Um, I just saw uh, a line drawing diagram of his latest kind of design for a smaller paddle raft, and mm. um, so he's Bill still, still doing it. Bill's actually he, doing the computer. He's still doing it, and um, that's, that's it, it's awesome. going great. Yeah, he's he's uh, he is again one of those people that you know if if you're around Bill and you're not learning something, yeah, um, you've made a mistake. 
How do you think this interview would be different um, right now, given the fact that we're, I think we're about over 30 minutes into it, if I was talking to Bill right now? Do you think, do you think our, the conversation would have been uh, taken a different route? I do. Yeah, I, I, I do. Um, Bill, the one thing about that I can say about Bill is you would be hard pressed to find a, a more humble person. Yeah. Um, he would never, ever, ever tell you any of these things. No. Um, no, Bill would, Bill would spend the, the entire time talking about how great all the people that have worked for him over the years are. That's right. That's, that's it. I that's mean, right. he would take zero credit. Uh, he would take all the blame for any mistakes that were ever made along yep. the path. And I love and this is what brings up the next point I, I want to touch. And this just shows you, again, I think the good companies are the companies that are willing to test things out, try new things. And, you know, I remember when you guys came out, I can't remember what it's called, but the, um, the inflatable drift boat, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. And so, so, um, the, the great thing is, is I obviously, like I said, I sold my raft back in the day and I, and I kept the drift boat. So I've always loved the drift boat, but, uh, explain, um, that boat because I saw when it first came out, I was like, man, this, this is pretty cool. Uh, explain the drift boat that talk about how, because I don't think you're making it anymore, right? We are not, um, we're not making it anymore. And so, uh, I'd love to dive into this one full, full disclosure on the inflatable drift boat. Um, I was one of the initial designers and, um, our CEO was kind enough to put my name on that patent. So, oh, wow. um, it's very, very close to my heart, uh, in terms of the, the Clearwater drifter and the Freestone drifter, which is, were the name of the two different sizes there. Yep. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a product that, uh, I, you know, literally ate, slept and, huh. and lived there for a few seasons, but the, the, the real story it's, it's like many products, um, is when we first started manufacturing, um, drop stitch up paddle boards, yep. we of course, like everybody else ran through a multitude of lengths, you know, beam, beam widths, uh, the amount of rocker bow and stern, you know, like everybody, we played with a ton of different designs until we kind of got it exactly where we wanted it to be. And on one of the larger or the largest versions of an inflatable stand-up paddleboard, it's sitting on the floor. I'm in our frame shop with our CEO, and I'm half-heartedly say, you know, that looks identical to the bottom of my Clackacraft drift boat. Uh, literally, I mean, there was so much rocker in this one design that we had, it was so wide and the way that it kind of tapered oh, and yeah. that led to a couple of beers, <laughs> uh, at one of the local breweries nice. and some, you know, line drawings on bar napkins. And I think it was probably within 180 days that he had the, the first sample built up. And so the idea behind the inflatable drift boat for us, which was kind of born, when we started rebuilding the NRS frame all those years ago, when we started rebuilding the NRS frame, basically what I, what I challenged our R and D team with is here's my drift boat. I literally brought my clock craft right down to NRS, parked it in the front lot mm. and said, I want our raft to be as functional to fish from as my drift boat. Yeah. What I think is the, the, you know, penultimate, uh, craft for, yep. for river fishing. Right. Yep. And so we tried, and of course we came to the conclusion that we can get pretty damn close, but nothing is a drift boat. Just it, nothing is a drift boat. Um, and once we had the opportunity with drop stitch to really kind of build out that hull, and then again, so fortunate to have an absolute engineering wizard in our frame shop manager who was able to come up with a design that allowed us to stuff a frame inside of that hull shape. Um, you know, the rest is, as they say, history type thing. It was just one of those products that for us, we realized, wow, we can do this. And now we can actually give people the opportunity to fish out of a drift boat in Mongolia, right? um, to fish out of a drift boat on Moraine. Like there, there are streams that are in, you know, the middle of nowhere, Southwest Alaska, the middle of nowhere, China, the middle, yep. I mean, the middle of nowhere where now you're seeing drift boats. Yeah. Um, something that, you know, you, you could never, ever, ever do before. So that it was, it was an incredible project. Um, you know, the reality for us with, with that one was just simply that the demand on drop stitch has gotten so intense and has gotten so competitive that 
we were going to, the, the MSRP on that boat was literally going to double over the course of a couple of seasons. Oh, wow. And it became a, a, a thing for us where it was like, wait, we can't, yeah. we can't charge this much for, for yeah, this type for, of a product. So that's right. Gotcha. So it was, a, so the boat itself and, and having never been in it before, I'm curious because, you know, we're doing, well, we kind of have a side series. It's uh, it's called the drift boat season. I've been interviewing different companies. We've had, you know, a lot of different ones, Boulder, some of the, and we've had, um, you know, the fiberglass stuff, we've had wood, we have aluminum companies and, you know, there's all this mix, but you know, the, you guys had the only inflatable, right? I mean, I think that, <laughs> yeah. that's around. Oh, yeah. So how does it, how did it function? Um, or how did it feel differently than say a, like your clacker craft? Uh, you know, quite honestly, the, the biggest difference was how much lighter our version of that boat was. And, you know, that was ended up being, unfortunately, one of the drawbacks. Wow. Um, so, as you know, uh, rowing a river, um, really everything is about where you set your ferry angles, right? In terms mm-hmm. of being able to get back and forth ac- across the river, being able to keep your anglers a consistent distance from the bank while they're fishing dry flies, all that type of thing. And obviously, as we talk about ferry angles, you become 100% dependent upon the depth of your chine. So I know we're getting a little bit techie now, but yeah. obvious, obviously right. in a Clackacraft drift boat, um, you will actually be able to sink the, yeah. when you put your two anglers and your guide in a cooler, you'll sink that chine up to an inch or say two inches in the river. And now you've got a hard edge against which to pivot. Yep. Um, well, obviously you carry that over to an inflatable that you had to put upwards of a thousand pounds in to sink that oh, two wow. inches. Wow. Um, you never really created those hard ferry angles. Gotcha. So, that was a benefit in, you know, big whitewater, or it was a benefit when you're trying to pick through, you know, boulder fields on the upper middle fork in September. Yep. But when you're on the Missouri in April and it's blowing 30, oh, right. um, that drip boat was good. not ideal. Not good. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Okay, <laughs> so, that, that makes sense. That, that was, the, I guess, the only kind of really, you know, negative um, yeah. against it. And then honestly, the only other one that I can that I can come up with that was um, very obvious is, you know, even in a drop stitch floor, even at 15 PSI, it creates obviously a very rigid platform. Um, but there's still nothing like standing on Yep. you know, aluminum or, or glass, whatever. Or, I mean, and it's, it's, yeah, exactly. And it's yeah. becomes really obvious, especially as, as I, you know, would talk to the guiding community. Um, you know, a lot of those guys have the majority of, of their are, you know, say 55 to 70 years old, um, and don't necessarily have boat legs under them. Right. They yeah. came from Texas oh, right, or right. Florida or California or whatever Unstable. and have maybe never been in a drift boat or, or a raft. And, and so you try to stand them up on that floor um, and that could be a little bit more of a struggle than it was in the yeah. traditional, you know, hard floor drift That's boat. Right. So That's there's right. some feedback that way. But as you know, um, if you give a guide any product long enough, they're oh, going to yeah. come back to you with a, a long find, list of things. They'll find something. <laughs> well, no, and that makes sense. I mean, I, in the wind, I will say for the wind, I mean, I think – and the guys at I think Adipose they talked about when they were on that you know any any typical standard drift boat drift boat in the wind is going to get rocked you know get blown pretty good compared to say like these little river skiffs which are low profile and all that and and even a raft well the raft's totally different because that you know as you compare a dr- it's interesting because when I think of a raft because obviously I've had rafts you know if you're on a windy river yeah a raft is tough you know, a drift boat actually seems like it because you can row it faster, right? Especially if there's an upwind. Um, what would you say about that? Does a raft ever perform well, like your standard otter 14 foot in wind? No. Yeah. No, no, no. And it's same, same exact reason. It's, it's literally designed to move horizontally across the water column, right? So we build a raft with no, no chines, no yeah. keels, no, no, nothing that prevents it from moving horizontally across the river. So it's literally when the wind picks up and starts yep. blowing you across the that's river, right. that's why because is, it was designed to do that. Why the horizontal? Why not have uh, like more of a drift boat? Because in the design of a raft, we want to be able to, our, 
our, our function is to allow you to get across the river from the, you know, river right bank to river left bank as quickly as possible. Um, in the design of the rafts, obviously having a fully flat bottom, uh, the, the purpose there originally was designed for moving water. And as you know, in moving water, being able to move left and right becomes really important. It's the exact same thing in a drift boat where you get blown around. But again, the difference is that in a drift boat, you'll start, say you start blowing to the river left, you catch your chime. So oh, now right. in your drift boat, the wind has to blow the blow weight the of the entire boat yeah. all the way across the river. Whereas in a raft, it's just pushing you across the stream the yeah, same way that, that the boat was designed to. So, exactly. So yeah. yeah, I would say in the wind, um, you know, no, nobody, yeah. nobody's winning. No, no raft, no <laughs> raft is good. No, I, I think it, and obviously yeah. there's tons of, um, you know, there's tons of ways we could take this. I, I did want to just touch again, if we, if we go back to that gear, you know, that I'll put some links in the show notes to, to the raft frame, the NRS raft frame, the, and I'm not sure on the drift boat. I mean, there must be some of those still out there. Are they, um, you can find them out there. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, it's funny. So there are, um, locations around the country where specific groups of guides, basically all just determined or outfitters all just determined that this drift boat is the best product. Period. Oh, no kidding. We, we, we don't want anything else. Oh, yeah. Amazing. We've got like places in Southern Wyoming. Um, a couple of those streams, I, I can't, uh, say sure. out loud be, yeah, yeah. because those outfitters <laughs> will show up on my front door. Yeah. Um, you know, some of those places where literally that drift boat is exactly what they've been looking That's for cool. forever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, they're out there. There's still, you know, probably I would say 30 of them that, that are in Montana. Yeah. Um, I see them, you know, as I'm driving down highway 90 going to Bozeman or whatever, I, I, I see them all the time. That's so cool. Oh yeah, they're they're still out there, and it's yeah. crazy the number of phone calls that we still get people asking for them. Um, yeah, and it's something that we hope to bring back. But again, it was yeah. one of those situations for us where it was just like, wow, exactly. Do we, do we really want to charge this much? And totally. the answer just became no. So, and just to leave that off, you know, um, or leave this one off, and just kind of uh, seal this up. I mean, as far as you know, you person, I'm not sure how many products you've developed, obviously Bill's developed a lot, but how, how does that feel? You know, you've got this boat, which sounds like a pretty cool idea. I never wrote it, but you know, basically it's not, you're not selling it anymore. I mean, what, what is your, you know, do, do you, do you kind of take positive or more negative away from this or what's your take on it? Oh man, for me, I, so I'm a, a, a person who grew up in a house where, you know, education was always the most valuable thing that you could ever get. Um, you know, the, the knowledge of, of learning how to do something or an experience of, of learning how to do something was always stressed in my life as, as being so incredibly valuable. And, and so, you know, the honest answer is that of course I'm, I was sad when it came down to, Hey, look, this is how much we have to charge if you want to keep building this thing. And I recognized immediately that we had basically priced ourselves out of the market, um, so I was sad. You're always sad to see one of your, you know, your, your baby get, get pulled down off of the catalog, especially, I mean, you know, this was a product that again, I grew up an angler and this was a product that we got into the Orvis fly oh, fishing catalog. That's right. Um, I got that boat into, you know, Bass Pros oh, wow. fishing catalog. I, I worked with, you know, the guys out in Northern California and Mike gave me a full page spread, um, in the fly shops catalog. Wow. Like, the, the, you, I mean, that for me, when we got into the fly shop catalog was like, we have made it. Yeah. The, the, it, there is nothing better than this. We have officially huh. arrived. Um, so it was bittersweet. I was sad to see it go. But at the same time, the amount of knowledge that our R&D team gathered throughout that process is invaluable. Yeah. Um, you know, they always talk about, you know, every billionaire has gone bankrupt 10 times That's or whatever right. that stupid statistic right. is. Not that we were going to go bankrupt with that product, <laughs> but, uh, and certainly not that I'm on my way to being a billionaire, but yeah. it, it's one of those things of, um, the experience of having taken a product from a bar napkin and, and eventually landing it in the fly shops catalog and Orvis and Bass Pro and all these places, um, is an experience for me that, that I'll never, ever forget. 
and is an experience for our entire R&D team and our entire sales team that we long to replicate. Yeah. Um, we're always, always, always hunting. And I can't tell you, you know, how many products we've developed and developed and then said, eh, that's not good enough. Let's, let's start over. Um, yeah. or, you know, that ah, we're close, but this has to change before we can really go to market with it. And so, um, I've loved that experience. And as, as, as much of a bummer as it was to have to call some of those, you know, long-term outfitter partners and tell them that we weren't manufacturing the boat anymore. Yeah. Um, the experience of having, you know, um, developed that thing and brought it to market is, is something that is, you know, I'll, I'll carry with me forever. And, uh, so no, it, it's, it's a bummer to see it go, but at the same time, um, you know, like everybody I'm on to 10 other new projects and, um, each of which is more exciting than the next. And, you know, there, there's always something really exciting coming at NRS. So it's very, very easy to, to just kind of, oh yeah, that's gone now. And I've got these five things I'm focusing on next. So let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Sawyer offers a full line of modern and traditional products for oarsmen, canoeists, kayakers, surfers, and paddlers of all genres, providing unsurpassed function, performance, and beauty. They design and handcraft every product in the USA, ensuring everything they make is from the highest quality materials with careful attention to detail. They take pride in their employees, stewardship of the environment, and our country. In return, you have the assurance of knowing the product you receive from them is genuine, made in America, and cannot be replicated. I've been using Sawyer products for a long time now, which is why I'm definitely excited to share them with you on the podcast here. I've been down some crazy technical whitewater and uh, mini fishing adventures that put me in places that were... um, where I had to make a good move. And I, I love the design, the power, the performance, and always knowing that um, I can count on that stroke, even when you need to make you know that one to get past the rock or whatever. You can always count on Sawyer for that. And you can count on them as well. Sawyer products are designed by paddlers, oarsmen, and surfers alike to fully meet your performance needs. Pick up one today and experience the feel of water. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Sawyer to grab your set today. That's Sawyer, S-A-W-Y-E-R, wetflyswing.com slash Sawyer to get started. Okay, now let's get back to the show. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you guys are keeping busy. Yeah, that's the thing you got to, right, you're staying ahead of the puck, right? You guys, you're you're a leader, so you've got to always be thinking, how are you going to keep ahead of the next company? That's probably, you know, are probably a lot of them copying you guys and all sorts of other stuff, right? Yeah, and, and we're so fortunate to be in, you know, obviously the outdoor industry, but more specifically the paddle sports industry where, I mean, you know, our biggest competitors are, you know, people like air, um, people like DRE who, you know, Sean and Dan down at air are two of my closest friends in Boise, (laughs) like Mm -hmm. the CEO at air. I would never dream of going to Boise and not taking him out to dinner. Mm -hmm. Uh, same thing with the guys at DRE, uh, you know, Phil and and his team down there in Denver are all really, really good friends. So yes, we're, we're all in competition and yes, those guys at air and those, certainly those guys at DRE, I mean, talk about, talk about a fishing frame. I mean, what DRE has, has been producing over the last five, seven years is staggering. Oh, cool. Um, they, they've absolutely upped the bar and then up to the bar and then up to the bar again in terms of, you know, product development there. So yeah, we're, we're incredibly lucky to be pushed by amazing, amazing competitors inside the paddle sports industry and I say we're so fortunate because, you know, these guys are all our competitors, but at the end of the day, um, you know, we all go drink beers together and, and go fishing together. And, you know, we're, we're very fortunate to be a part of a, uh, kind of a, a, a big paddle sports family for lack of a better term. That's cool. Yeah. And I'm not totally familiar. Um, I guess DRE is downriver equipment. Yes, correct. Yeah. 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 Sorry, and no, no. And I'm not totally familiar. You guys, I know very well. I don't know the, I'll put a link in the show notes to their website and, uh, and, we won't have time to dig into um, what they have going, but it looks like maybe they have more of a um, more of a gear type uh, frame set up. Yeah. Oh yeah, and so they're uh, the same as when you kind of mentioned, uh, you know, custom framework that type stuff. I mean, DRE is is the name when it comes to a custom frame. Oh, cool. They won't even they won't even 
build you a frame without having either your boat or an exact version of your boat on their floor. Like they, they custom build everything that they do. Oh, they're, wow. they're, they're an incredible frame builder Amazing. Yeah. and, and a raft dealer and full disclosure, an incredible NRS dealer. Um, so yeah, they're, they're yeah. the, they're the, the full deal right there in Denver. You can go get fully set up there. That's so cool. I mean, it, it, this is the amazing thing. And kind of podcasting is similar. I always like to make the analogy because I talk to people all the time that, you know, we're one of the, we've grown into one of the leaders in the fly fishing podcast space, but I talk to people all the time that had never, never heard of the show. You're right. And they're just like, right. Oh God, never heard of it. And they're in there. You know what I mean? And then yeah. I, and then I came into it and they're like, Oh yeah, this is, this is amazing. All the content, same thing with DRE. I mean, I knew nothing about this company. And as I look at it, I'm like, wow, they have a beautiful frame. I mean, they got yeah. rod holders and all sorts of amazing <laughs> stuff. Yeah, they do. They're, they're just, like I said, and you know, I, I mentioned them specifically because you asked the question about, um, you know, our competitors helping to drive us forward. I yeah. mean, you can't, you can't look at what they're doing and not be like, damn, that's way better than what <laughs> we've got right now. Like we, we got to do better. That's right. Um, that's right. And I love that. I, I, yeah. I love that. You know, we're, we're surrounded by amazing, small, manufacturers in our business. I mean, they're everywhere you look, there's another really, really cool story of, of another company who's, you know, doing something similar to us. So that's why I say it's, it's, it's a family. It's crazy how, how, you know, close all of the paddle sports companies are. I I mean, I I could go on and on for, for ages, but it's, you know, most of my biggest competitors are all the people that I seek out at trade shows for a big hug and That's right. hey, if, you know, if I can yep. buy you a beer after your next meeting or whatever, <laughs> like let's do it type deal. So, is the outdoor retailers is that kind of the big? Are there any other big trade shows that you guys go to? Yeah, I mean, we go to a number of trade shows, but yeah, outdoor retailer is certainly you know the major kind of venue for everybody to come together. There's also, um, a show out in Florida. It's called ICAST. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. which is ba- basically the, the big fishing show. You're familiar with that one. Yeah. Um, we'll go to IFTD, which, you know, had been in Denver, but we'll be now be in Salt Lake. Um, so, you know, yeah. w- we still do trade shows, obviously like a lot of companies, uh, 2020 COVID, <laughs> um, has forced us to recalculate, you know, some of that stuff. Obviously the biggest reason why we go to trade shows is because, um, well, first of all, we want to get our product out there, but it's because our customers go to trade shows. Yeah. And as travel has been inhibited and, you know, what we're hoping is that sooner than later here, um, our customers will feel safe enough and, and start traveling again. And as soon as, as soon as our customers tell us that, hey, yeah, we're we're going to be at these trade shows again, then absolutely trade shows immediately go back up on our calendar. So cool, cool, cool. Well, let, let, yeah. let's wrap this uh, slowly, uh, kind of wrap this up here. And I want to go back to the list we had there yeah. because I, I, let's think of the person that, you know, they they they're just going to your website and they just they want to get everything. They don't have anything. They want to get all their stuff to have their whitewater raft dialed in for the next fishing trip. And so we talked about, you know, you mentioned the raft. I'll make I'll put a link to the otter. I'm sure it's got a ton of features that, that make it cure. Um, we got the wrap, the frame, the, uh, the PFD, the straps, the knife, the apparel, um, the bills bag. Uh, and, and I guess, I guess the cooler too, right? That's one big thing. You guys make a, make a cooler, right? A kind of a, you have one of those extreme type, um, coolers. We are a distributor. Um, we manufactured coolers for a number of years, but basically, MOQs just got bit too large for us and we opted out oh, cool. of it. Um, I do, I do build a, a soft sided cooler, which is an, a, a, a much more affordable option, yeah. uh, versus like the Yeti or the Ingle. I'm a distributor for Yeti for Yeti. Um, yeah. yeah. And obviously you can't go wrong. I, I'm uh, guilty of owning multiple <laughs> Yeti coolers and totally. I, it's so funny. I don't know how we all existed without a cooler that would keep ice for seven days. It's, I know it's, it's, well, it's pretty funny, but it's interesting. I'll put a link to it. I've been, you know, as I've been on this drift boat season, I've been kind of focusing, and that's why I'm talking to you guys, is now, obviously, you focus more on rafts, but, I mean, just the whole gear thing. What do you need to get going? And, and you guys have a ton of good stuff. And we did talk to um, a company recently, Canyon Coolers, who has a similar yeah. a similar cooler. And it was really cool. I didn't know, again, I didn't know anything about Canyon Coolers. And I started talking to, uh, 
you know, the founder, and I was like, wow, th- this sounds like a really amazing cooler, very similar to Yeti, Ye- Yeti, right, and all that. But um, so I don't know. I think all these companies, like you said, DRE, there's so many of these great companies. There's lots to ch- lots to choose from. But anything else we want to add to that list that we're missing here? If somebody wants to get all their stuff, w- what are we missing here to get them down in for a river trip? The first one that jumps to the front of my mind there, just we've done the raft in frame. So, of course, you know, the next big piece that we're missing there is an oar. Right. Um, and I'm going to throw one more of these incredible companies at you called Sawyer. Um, Sawyer's based in Maupin, Oregon. Awesome, awesome company, you know, kind of Southwest Oregon. And Jim, let me cut you off there just really quick, just because uh, Sawyer is actually currently a sponsor for the podcast. So I want to give oh. a shout out. Yeah. So there, and I, I've had Kevin on, he's, um, I'll highlight in the show notes, a link. We are, did an interview with Kevin. He was awesome. So yeah, I, we are fortunate cool. to have, I think one of the best or companies out there. So we have a bunch of uh, resources there as well. Exactly. So that would be where I would put them or point your, your listener in terms of, Hey, you need, you need the boat. You need, you need that otter. Uh, you need the frame yep. and then the oars are, are the next great place to start. Obviously, um, we talked about the Chinook PFD and then one of the other ones that for me is, is, is really, really important, but it gets glossed over oftentimes. Um, the next one that you absolutely must have is a rescue throw bag. Oh yeah. Um, that's one of those things, you know, people look at me like, really a throw bag. Do I absolutely have to have that? And my answer is, do you ever go boating or fishing with somebody that you love? Yeah. And the answer is, of course, yes. And I say, well, then, yeah, you need this. It's, you know, it literally, it, co- it costs 65 bucks. And when your dad falls out of the front of your boat because he was trying to net that big brown, uh, as opposed yep. to watching him float under the bridge, you can God. just throw him the throw bag. Exactly. Type thing. So uh, that's the next one for me that, of course, jumps right off the page. Is, yeah. You know, you, you got to have a throw bag, um, you know, a hundred percent. I know it sounds crazy, but the other one, just cause we're talking safety, um, you got to have a whistle. Oh, yeah. I, I know, I know it sounds silly to people and they think, what is this guy talking about? But I have personally been on more than one river rescue where a boat flipped and everything gets f- washed, including people. Yeah. And you're, you're literally maybe five, seven, 10 minutes into the rescue and you're short of person or two. Mm-hmm your mind runs to they're gone. Well, immediately you hear a whistle from 600 yards downstream. Cool. Cause as we know, it takes two seconds to get that far away and okay, boom, we can stop the rescue effort. They just got washed around the corner, but the whistle, I, I just can't stress it enough. It sounds stupid, Amazing. but literally for seven yeah. bucks, a whistle can save your life. You, you got to have one in your boat. It, 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 you'd be silly not to. I love that you said that because that the whistle for me too, like like you, similar with not wearing the life jackets. I mean, I went for years and I was always like, yeah, this whistle. I mean, I've got it, but but why why do I have it? But you, I, I will let my girls know too because they always have their whistles with them. But it, I, I've never heard anybody actually say, but that makes so much sense. Yeah, within seconds, that person could be, you could think they drown, but they're literally just yeah. downstream. Around the corner, standing on a big rock in the middle of the river going, when are these guys going to come around the corner and get me? Well, everybody's upstream looking for you. I literally have had two experiences in my life of, of this and both times nobody, everything was fine, but both times we would have continued searching for who knows how many hours were it not for a whistle. Like, Hey, do you hear that? That's amazing. I hear a whistle. Yeah. It's just yeah. way the hell downstream. Let's send somebody down there. And sure enough, both times the, the people were just waiting downstream. So go. whistle, put a whistle in your VFD. Hopefully you never, ever need it, but yep. it, it's worth having one there. Um, the next one that I have to jump to it for me is the Boulder dry box. So this is, this takes me back again. I, I know I mentioned briefly, um, a, a canoeing background as a little kid, you know, mm-hmm. growing up canoeing in the boundary waters. And back then there was a product called the York box, uh, which was effectively a knockoff of something called a Wanigan for anybody who's ever spent time in a canoe. They'll know what I'm talking about there. Um, but this Boulder camping dry box is basically for us, our version of the old York box. And what it is, is effectively just a plastic or a rotomolded molded plastic dry box. Um, the reason for me, why this is such a killer product for anglers is this ends up for me when I was a guide, this ended up being, you know, my, my go-to dry box that had my med kit in it. Uh, it had my emergency beacon. This is where I keep all those kind of for lack of a better term, oh shit products, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, This is where you keep your flare. This is where you keep your emergency blanket. 
and this thing literally will fit right underneath a rower seat. So for me, uh, you know, there, there are some other versions of, of product out here that kind of does a similar job, but there's nothing for the value of this, this Boulder dry box. I, I have one in my boat that is, is my, like I said, it, it never yeah. gets opened hopefully, but it's my absolute, you know, you're going on a multi-day, it goes in the boat and it's, it's kind of that box that, you know, is there. So this is a dry box. This is not similar to like the, the, the aluminum dry boxes that fit into your frame. This is like a smaller box. Exactly. Yep. And it is a dry box in terms of it's fully gasketed and it does seal. So, I mean, I've, I've sunk these things to the bottom of a river and it is a dry box, um, but it's not aluminum. And the greatest part about it not being aluminum is it's super lightweight and the other part of it, again, is that it's much, much smaller. Um, it's about, you know, say 25% of the size of one of those Eddie Out aluminum dry boxes. Okay. So it's something you're going to, you could strap on maybe on your, your top of your frame so it's easily accessible. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. That's great. And that's, yeah, that, and that's a totally good, a good feature. Okay. So, um, and maybe just before we kind of finish this off, is there a resource page or something we can direct somebody if we don't touch on everything like the checklist of what they need? Absolutely. If they go to just nrs.com, um, literally running across the very top of my website, there's a, you know, a, an options bar. We actually have an option called fishing. Um, if they mm -hmm. click on fishing, it, it even breaks it down further. Um, I've got another ca set of subcategories under there, fishing boats, fishing apparel, fishing frames, uh, oars, fishing safety. So yeah, it, it fully breaks it out across all these categories. Um, from nrs.com under the fishing tab, they'll be able to find all of these, all of these products with, without too many clicks. All right. Perfect. Perfect. And, uh, yeah. And I guess before, as we start to kind of wrap this up, anything else we missed, um, you know, from, if we're thinking about this whitewater gear, anything big we want to just touch on? You know, for me, the only other piece of advice that I would throw out there just simply, be, you know, as you mentioned, the title of kind of fishing whitewater yeah. is, um, the, the philosophy or the concept of rig to flip, um, that, that's something that, again, I came to NRS having never heard that statement before, no. but, um, we're at a put in and, you know, everybody's kind of putting their stuff in their boat. And I'm of, of course the, you know, I've got more river miles than a lot of these guys put together and I'm standing there watching these guys all strap all this stuff down. And I'm like, mm why are they, why are they doing that? I've got, you know, just loose stuff in my boat, fishing equipment, just kind of floating around. And, um, sure enough, as, as a fishing guide, you know, for countless years, I never, ever dealt with flips. Like I never saw anybody flip a drift boat. I was never on a, a fishing trip in rafts where somebody flipped a raft. Like I, I had just been very, very fortunate. Well, as you start actually fishing in real whitewater, and what I'm talking about now is like launching on the upper lock saw in the spring to go fishing where you are literally running class four whitewater yeah. and fishing. I mean, I'm <laughs> talking big whitewater, lock saw falls, big whitewater, but hmm. also fishing. Um, everything gets tied down. I mean, everything gets tied down in your boat, literally from the put in. The rig to flip means that you from the put in have every single piece of equipment strapped down, tied in so that if you were to flip your boat, you lose nothing. Hmm. How many fly fishermen, it's unfortunate. We all know oh, an yeah. angler or two out there who has the yeah. story of, dude, I flipped last weekend. I lost yeah. all my Everything. fly boxes. I lost two rods. I lost my Costas. Like, you know, we've all, we've all got that bro. We, we've all had yeah. that story told around a campfire. Um, and NRS is, the, or it's not an NRS philosophy. It's just a big whitewater philosophy, but the philosophy of rig to flip would, it, would, would have saved all those guys, you know, countless dollars in gear. Yeah. Um, and it's a philosophy for me that I, even when I'm just putting in on, you know, Easy. shoot, a, 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 yeah, a teeny tiny class one stream or whatever, um, I still rig to flip. Yeah. And it, it's just, a, it's a really the level of um, confidence and the lack of concern that you have were something to happen. You don't, you're not scrambling. Oh shit. You know, my Winston, don't let my Winston go. Uh, you know, that type <laughs> feeling where if everything's tied in, it's okay. Your first concern should be what you're, what, what you save want yourself. it to be. Yeah. Save yourself, save your wife, like, yeah. you know, save your guest. Who yeah. cares about the stuff? It's all tied to the boat. Yeah. Um, so that would be the thing for me that I would definitely say to people in terms of That's when you awesome. go, when you launch, it's, it's, 
imperative, even if you think the chances of flipping are zero, um, the peace of mind in knowing that all your stuff is tied down, um, it is, you know, I, yeah. I can't put a dollar value on it. That's and amazing. so, and I know that this, I'm not trying to be, you know, cheesy with this at all, but we do make a product called a raft cargo net. Oh, yeah. And for people who are doing, like I, I mentioned, I'm launching on the Smith on Friday. Um, you know, that's going to be myself and one other guy. He's actually our Pacific Northwest sales rep will be in my boat. He'll of course be in the, in the bow and the stern will be all of our stuff, right? All of our, Mm -hmm. you know, camping equipment for the week, all of, all of our extra, you know, fishing stuff that we have with us for the week. And literally all I do is I bring one of these NRS raft cargo nets. We build a huge mound of gear in the stern kind of compartment of the boat. You can throw that net over it. It takes, you know, quick. 45 seconds and now a hundred percent of your gear is tied into your boat. It's tied in. Um, yeah. it's not only, you know, for me on those big multi days, it's not only about, about having something fall off. If you flip, it's about, you just, you know, ran a big wave train and you know, that you're going up and down these big steep waves and oh, all of a sudden that one dry box that was just kind of neatly, yeah. you know, nested on top. Well, no, now that just falls off and it's gone or, um, so for me, th- th- this type of uh, a network's awesome in terms of you're going on that multi-day or even for me, like if we do an overnight, um, you know, on the South fork or something like that here in the flathead, um, throw that over the back of it. I put a big table on top of that. My dog sit up there, you know, you have zero concern. You can yeah. flip your boat. You're not going to lose a single stick of, cool. uh, yeah. of gear. I'm glad you said that. That's just another, another product that's good to have on that list. And yeah, as far as flipping, I mean, that's the great thing about the raft. Obviously we had a, um, <clears throat> Pete McBride was on, he talked about Martin Litton, you know, the little bit of the story there with the Grand Canyon and those dories, those river dories, right? They, they can flip, <laughs> you know, and yeah. it, it blew me away because I'm like, oh my God, you could flip a drift boat and then flip it back over. And, right. uh, so I've just been totally addicted to, to watching the videos, but, um, but more, mostly you can't do that in a drift boat. If you dump your drift boat, you're, you're toast. You just lost all your stuff. And right. One of the benefits oh. of the raft is, is, is like you said, you tie it in and you're good to go what would you i mean do you have a story as we as we kind of take it out of here i mean i don't know if you've ever been in the middle of it or heard of a crazy flipping story do you have something you could just kind of shed some light on oh man i have the the world's worst flipping or one of the not the worst because no one died but yeah so um i'm gonna go all the way back to spring of 2001 I am a fresh graduate from the University of Arizona. I finally get up to Whitefish, Montana with a woman who at the time is my girlfriend, who's now my wife, uh, get my hands on my very first 13 foot otter, uh, oh, wow. go, go partners with a guy on this boat, uh, get my, my first otter. And for anybody who's launched in the Canyon section of the Blackfoot in the last 20 years, they'll know the exact spot that I'm talking about within the first three river miles, there's a big giant sweeping right-hand corner underneath an old bridge. And there's still two big bridge pylons that, that kind of sit there. The river has since blown out differently, but, uh, for, for any old Montana people Mm. don't know exactly what I'm talking about here, but you used to come around this big sweeping, uh, left-hand corner and right in the middle was a big bridge pylon. Well, it was an easy to move miss if, if you knew what you were doing while, of course, I'm in my, my very first day of my brand new raft. I've got my wife in the bow. I've got my chocolate lab in the stern and wrap my boat perfectly around oh. uh, that bridge pylon. Of course, it spit us. We flip. Um, everyone's fine. I did lose a rod. I did lose a bunch of fly boxes. Yep. Um, and of course it's Montana, it's spring immediately upon getting the boat flipped, everything kind of wrung out and dried. It starts snowing. Um, so this is my first time ever taking my wife down the river, me telling her like, babe, we're good. I got (laughs) this. This is the, you know, this is the thing. Um, so yes, I flipped a boat, but the best part of that story is, you know, fast forward forward. Uh, the fishing was phenomenal. Uh, the rest of the day we, we forced our way through it and, and had just a great day of fishing. So of course, wake up the next morning and decide to do the exact same float um, get to just above the spot where I flipped the previous day. And my buddy who's been an outfitter in Montana now for shoot 25 years, uh, pulls his drift boat up and, you know, says, Hey, you know, I'll, I'll take your wife through this just in case things oh, go right. awry again. And I'm like, yeah, you know, good call. Let's, or at the time, my girlfriend, yeah, let's, yeah. let's put her in the boat over there. And 
So as my girlfriend is, you know, jumping ship, no pun intended, <laughs> uh, we're kind of pulled up side by side with, with this drift boat and my chocolate lab, who's supposed to be my best friend on earth, right? The nothing like a loyal lab, uh, went right over the side and, and jumped right into the drift boat as well. He was like, dude, I'm out. <laughs> I, I'm not going down this rapids with you again yeah, today. You're crazy. So I, uh, proceeded to have to, to have the, the run of shame there. No dog, no girlfriend, no nothing, uh, day two, but I, I did make it through safely the second day. And, there you um, go. but yeah, so I, I've seen him where, you know, it's, it's a fishing trip, right? It's the Blackfoot. It's yeah. class two at best. Like, nothing's going to happen. There's no way that anybody could get hurt. And boom, you come around a corner and oh my gosh, there's a big exactly. giant bridge pylon in the middle of the river and one false move and we're swimming. You're I done. mean, literally uh, every, yeah. you know, everybody knows how it goes. It it's takes quick. two seconds. Yep. Next thing you know, you're, you're gasping for air type. Yeah. Thing. So, um, I have been there and, you know, fortunately I've, I've, I married a Montana girl, so she, she's super tough and she could deal with it. But, uh, you know, that could have gone a, a whole different way, right? She could have had a miserable experience oh, yeah. committed to never going fishing yep. with me again. Like, I mean, that could have gone way, way sideways. Exactly. For me, so. exactly. Cool. All right. Well, I think we're about there. Any, um, I guess as you look out, uh, the next, uh, six to 12 months, anything new you guys want to give a shout out to on NRS or anything you have coming up personally? Yeah. I mean, whew, shoot, in terms of coming up personally, you know, like everybody, I'm, I'm really excited to, to kind of start to get things back to normal here. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a, a, a salesperson and, uh, really miss all of our customers. I really miss all of my sales reps. I really miss right. all of my NRS family that, uh, I haven't been able to see. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, just, just getting back out, getting out of my basement and, and, and yep. seeing some people giving some hugs. I can't Gosh. wait for that. Yeah. Um, but on a, on a, just a straight up selfish level, um, I am leaving for Southeast Alaska, uh, in like two weeks, oh, nice. um, for a week on the Sittuk, which uh -huh. is a steelhead stream, a steelhead stream, um, that flows through a little town called Yakutat. And it, yep. it's, um, it, your, your listeners who are from, who are familiar with the Sittuk will be jealous, uh, for people who have been there before, uh, they, they know what it is. It's, it, it is one of the most insane steelhead streams ever anywhere. If you ever get a chance to go, uh, take it. It, it, it cool. is a life changing, uh, stream. I, I will equate it to uh, having, like I said, been a guy who's worked on Bristol Bay for a long time. I'll equate the steelhead run in the Sittuk to some of the silver salmon runs that I have seen oh, wow. on Bristol Bay. And by that, I mean, yeah, crazy. we've come around the corner on some of these, on some of these, you know, Jeez. spots and there's, you know, a hundred paired, uh, mating pairs of steelhead on gravel bars. Wow. Like, I mean, you obviously no one's fishing. You're just looking at this point. You're just an observer to yeah. the, the spectacle that still exists in a handful of places on the planet. But literally I'm talking, you know, 40 inch, 20 plus pound steelhead sitting in a foot of water, actively defending a red. I mean, it, yep. it's one of those places on the earth that, uh, just to see it, to stand there, uh, to take a deep breath of, of the air that, that, you know, circulates it in that space. Um, makes me feel like a lucky person. So I've go. got that upcoming, uh, steelhead fishing is, is still for me. Um, it in yep. terms of fishing. So, um, <laughs> awesome. so I'm looking forward to that and, uh, you know, shoot, like I said, I'm just, I'm just looking forward to, uh, to seeing some people. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's, I, it, it's, it's going to be awesome to give some hugs and, um, I'm not sure if, if you'll be in Florida for ICAST or if you'll be in Salt Lake. For yeah, I'll IFTD, be in Salt Lake. But, yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, well, we'll be there as well and certainly look forward to seeing oh, you there. And, and, uh, but yeah, I'm looking forward to people. Honestly, I'm looking I know. forward to people. Uh, I miss them. <laughs> uh, me too. I, th I think everybody's, yeah, just good. I think we're, I think we're on the cusp. I think, I think we're, uh, I've heard some talk that, you know, now that we got the, uh, things are going that maybe even, you know, it might be a June, July sort of things as, you know, we're still, it's going to take time, but yeah, it seems like October seems reasonable that we're going to be back in the show season. So hopefully, oh, keep keep fingers crossed. I'll send everybody out to uh, nrs.com and um, but yeah, Jim, this has been awesome. We've been uh, we've got a little bit longer. Uh, you've you know I think there's still a ton of stuff we left on the table, but I appreciate you shedding some light on everything and and love the stories and and the gear, man. To tell uh, everybody there thanks for me, and I'll I'll get the word out to everybody of that hasn't heard of you yet. 
Oh, Dave, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. Like I said, what you guys are doing here is, is awesome. And uh, if there's any, ever anything that we can help with, let us know. And I'll look forward to, uh, to seeing you in Salt Lake this fall. Sounds good, man. See you then. Thanks, sir. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes and all the links we cover, just go to fliswing.com slash 218. That is 218. Get a chance, head over to wetflyswing.com slash fly shop. That's uh, fly shop to support uh, our local fly shop and this podcast in one easy shot. Anything you purchase there uh, will get a commission on this podcast without any additional charge to you. Wanted to give you a heads up to tune in next, uh, this coming Tuesday, when uh, Al Q is here to break down striper fishing with a focus uh, on California surf. Another great show and another uh, species that we're going to add as well on that show. So stick around and you'll hear some good stuff that Al has. Uh, Click subscribe if you get a chance and uh, you'll get updated when that next episode arrives. That's it. That's a wrap. Looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to maybe see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.